it or not. The security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. It was my first day back on the job following my annual vacation. After I returned from my meal, Patrolman Fallon, the 124 man, brought in to me all the reports and communications pertaining to matters which were still open. I began to read them over, and at 10.30 p.m., while I was still so engaged, 63 men were patrolling the streets of the precinct on foot and in sector cars. Among them was patrolman Paul Cochran, whose post consisted of three blocks of tenements between 1st and 2nd Avenue in the 90s. He had just made his hourly ring into the station house from a call box on 1st Avenue and was headed through the block on another round of his post. Police! Hey, policeman! Yeah. Upstairs, upstairs in my house. Come on. What's the fellow, Pops? He threw me out. He threw me out of my own house. Uh, who? Him, the big one, George. There is a pop this building? Yeah. He threw me out. Right out of my own flat. Locked the door. Now why? For my daughter. I got it. For my daughter, Angie. Go ahead. Comes around and scares us to death. He's so big. He's drunk all the time. Well, he scares us to death. How old is your daughter? A baby, a little baby. She's 15. All right, hold it here. Yeah. Where do you live? What floor? Second floor. Second floor front. On this side? Yeah, yeah. He comes around drunk. He wants her to go out. And she don't want to go. He, he scares us to death. He's so big. Anybody else up there? No, just them. My, my wife is at work. I don't work. I can't. I'm sick. Yeah, all right. Let's go. Yeah. He's so big. He's drunk. He scares us to death every time. She don't want anything to do with him, Nancy. But she's scared. We don't know what to do. I'll take care of him, Pop. Oh, he throws me right out of my house. Which is it? That one? Yeah. What is that? The kitchen there? Uh, the kitchen, yeah. All right, Pop. You stay here, right behind me. She's a baby, Angie. Yeah, I know. You stay here. This is the police. Open up. Open the door. Come on, get it open. Are you all right? Angie. Angie, my baby. All right. Go on over with your father. Uh, take her in the other room, Pop. All right, baby. All right, all right. You two stay in there. What's the matter? What's the idea? What are you coming around bothering these people for? I'm not bothering anybody. You come up here drunk? Who's drunk? What's that? That's a bottle of wine I bought. You mean it was a bottle of wine? How old are you? 24. What's it to you? And why don't you stay away from 15-year-old girls? What I do is my business. Well, you made it mine. All right, come on, get up and walk around this side of the table. Suppose I don't want to. I don't want to have to come back there for you, George. Get up. You come back here for me, and you'll go away bleeding. See? Close that knife and put it on the table. A fat chance you got. Put that knife on the table. You use the stick, I'll use the knife. <laughs> we'll have a go. Put that knife on the table. Will you stop talking about the table? I'll give you the table. There you are, the table. Give me that. Get away from me. Come here. Let me go. Get up against that. Stop it. Get it out. Stop it. Come on. Stop it. We'll kill you. Stop it. Look at it, will you? Stick the knife across there. Go on. Go on. Stick it. All right. Slide down to the floor and sit now. Cut it out. Slide down. All right. All right. Now stay there. Sit right there. I see the hole in your head big enough to walk through. Pop. Right. I'm sorry. Just sit there. Pop. I'm sorry I cut you. I'm sorry. You want me? Come in here, Pop. What did he do? He stab you? I'm sorry. I thought I was sorry. You sit still, George. You got plenty of trouble. Don't buy yourself anymore. Oh, you're bleeding, you know that. I know it, yeah. Pick up that knife and bring it here, Pop. Yeah, yeah. 
I'm sorry. You'll be a lot sorry. Yes, he's a nice one. Oh, he's a good person. Those are nice ones. Yeah, all right. Hey, give it to me. Hey, listen. I had a few drinks. I'm a nice guy. All right, Pop. I'll tell you what I want you to do. Yeah? Hey, what do you say? I didn't mean it. Sit still, George. You're lucky I didn't shoot you before. I don't give you any trouble now. You know where that police call box in the corner is, Pop? Yeah? But go down there and open it up. Well, is it all right to do that? That's yeah, all right. Tell him a policeman has been injured and he needs help with a prisoner. Yeah, all right. Oh, Pop, wait a minute. Yeah? Uh, wait there for the officers to come, then you show them where it is. Okay? Okay. Okay, I'll wait there. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you. I didn't. I had a few drinks. It's bleeding. It's bleeding pretty bad. Hey, let me see if I can fix it. Just sit there, George. I don't like the way you fix things. Patrolman Cochran, who received a deep cut on the right side during the course of the struggle, was bleeding profusely as he guarded his prisoner at the point of his gun. When the radio call went out, the nearest RNP car was number 681, manned by Sergeant Waters as recorder and Patrolman Farrell as operator. They made the run and were the first to arrive. They met the complainant and were directed to the flat. They took the steps two at a time. Yes, sir. Right, sir. Get inside your off front. I'll show. Take care of it, pal. Yes, sir. And what do you got, Captain? Hey, he gave me a hard time. He started cutting at me. I'm sorry. I told you I was sorry. You'll keep quiet over there. Looks like he does a real haul in here. Yeah, the blood's coming fast. There's more policemen in here. They're coming. Okay, Pop, thanks. Stand over there out of the way, Pop. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Um, what's up? Are you calling me? Get away from him, Pop. That plane burned. I warned you. You keep quiet. Let me take a look at that, Cochran. Yeah. Carl. Oh. Yes, sir? Come here. Yes, Sergeant. I'll tell you what. Right, hey, here's the more policemen. Now, the girl, stay out in the hall. Uh, Jacoby, yeah. take care of that boy. Put the nippers on him and... Get him in the yellow room. All right, you come on. Put your gun up, Captain. Okay, Sergeant. Lean back there now. Uh, Farrell, give me a hand here. Yes, sir. No blood of blood, is it? He'll be all right. Now stop worrying about it. Just a nick in the leg. Now let's see if we can rip the pants off. Now wait a minute, Sergeant. They're brand new. They got a hole in them now, haven't they? What good are they? That material's pretty tough. Now, here's nice on the table. Get it, Farrell. Yes, sir. Isn't an ambulance coming, Sergeant? Yeah, an ambulance is coming. I, I just want to take a look at this. Here you are, Sergeant. Okay. Okay. Lean back there, Captain. And be careful. I couldn't stand to be nicked again. Just hold still. I'll grab it, Pato. I want it ripped all the way off. Yeah. That's right. Well, what a mess, huh? Hey, Pop. Come here. Yeah, yeah. Can I do something? Listen, Pop. Have you got any, uh... Oh, that's what I want. Farrell, get me one of those stockings hanging over the sink there. Okay, Sergeant. Hey, those are my Angie stockings. Yeah, I know, Pop. Don't worry about it. Uh, this is Pop. Oh, I have a neighbor. Here you go, Sergeant. Sit around there in the groin, Farrell. See if you can find a pressure point. I want to get some knots in the stocking. Yeah. Lean back there, Paul. And what are you going to do? I'm going to try to stop him. Okay, Angie just got this stocking. Don't try knots in her, please. Pop, stand over there like I told you, huh? But there's stockings. I'll get her a new pair. You slow the sound a little bit, Farrell. Yeah. All right, now. Let me get this around the side here. Yeah? Okay. Here's the pressure point, Sergeant. Put the big knot here. Okay. Raise up. I want to get the stocking on the other side of your hand. Yeah. Loop it. It's okay. Now, what do you think? Did you get an artery? Well, the blood's pretty red, isn't it? <laughs> Stop worrying about it. Give me his knife stick there. Yeah. I'll put it through. Yes, sir. You're going to tighten up now, Cocker. Let me know if it digs in too much. I don't think I have any tail in there. You'll know. I'll keep that stocking close to the groin as I kiss, though. Yes, sir. That's not getting too tight, is it? No, I'm not too. Not a couple of times. Hey, it's stopping. It's stopping bleeding. Pop, get over there out of the way. Yeah. Can you stand it there? It's okay. There's the skipper, Sergeant. Yeah. Hello, Cochran. Captain. Hi, Captain. Captain. What happened? Now, this man stopped me on the street. He said a fellow was up here bothering his 15-year-old daughter. I came up to get it straightened out. He came after me with a knife. Did you call him? Yes, sir. Mr. Uh, Colby's got him in there. Uh, Captain. Young. Uh, Farrell. Yes, sir. Hold it tight and count to 100. Then loosen it up and count to 50 before you tighten it again. Okay. I want to talk to you, Captain. Just lean back and relax. 
I think he's got that big artery in there, Captain. He's pouring out of the helicopter of a fountain. Did the call come over ambulance responding? Yes, sir. Well, you better send somebody down to check on it. Yes, sir. Uh, the car. Yes, sir. The downstairs will ring in. See where the ambulance is. Yes, sir. Looks like he lost a lot of blood. Yes, sir. Too much. Well, let's hope not too much, Sergeant. A lot is enough. Within another few minutes, an ambulance had arrived and Patrolman Cochran was taken to Mount Sinai Hospital at 5th Avenue and 103rd Street. In the meantime, the 21st Squad had been notified by the desk officer and before the ambulance departed for the hospital, Detectives DeLuca and Goldman arrived to take charge of the investigation. They questioned the prisoner, George Cotella, on the scene and then took him to the station house. When I went downstairs and got into my car, I instructed the operator, Patrolman Coley, to drive to the ambulance entrance at Mount Sinai. I got out of the car and walked through to the admitting office where the attendant told me Patrolman Cochran was being treated in emergency room number three. When I made the turn down the corridor, I saw Sergeant Waters waiting outside the open door to the treatment room. Hello, Captain. How is he? He wasn't so good when he came in, Captain. He was sort of going off, you know. Lost a lot of blood. Yeah. Well, as soon as they got him in here, they went to work with the plasma. You see? Mm -hmm. Oh, I guess that part is taken care of, all right. Who's the doctor? See that little fellow in there with the glasses? That's the one on this side. Yeah. He's a resident in surgery. Who's the other one? Well, uh, one of the nurses told me that one of the biggest surgeons on the staff was just finishing up an emergency appendectomy over in a private pavilion. She said, get him if I could. Mm -hmm. So I walked over there and asked him, and he said, sure, I'd be glad to. So, there he is, Dr. Lowfield. Okay, good. Did he tell you anything? Took one look at Cochran and went to work. Oh, listen, Captain, uh, Cochran's worried about how his wife's going to be notified. Well, where does he live? Out in Bayside, the 111th Precinct. Through the communications bureau in the precinct out there, why? Well, he's worried because she's five months pregnant and she's home alone with the, uh, their other kid. Oh. He says she's sure to think it's something a lot worse than just a cut in the leg. He'd like to call her on the phone himself. Well, we'll see what the doctor says. Yes, sir. And boy, George, sure that is nice sharp and on the summer. It was like a razor. Cochran's lucky he only got a nick in the leg instead of one in the head or the neck. Yeah. <laughs> He's done some real damage. He did enough damage as it is. Yes, sir. We got him here in time. Oh. Looks like they're through with him. For now, anyway. Mm -hmm. I want to meet the doctor. Yes, sir. Hello, Sergeant. Oh, uh, doctor, this is Captain Kennelly, commanding officer of the 21st Precinct. Uh, Dr. Lowfield. Doctor? How do you do, Captain? Well, I certainly appreciate you taking care of one of my men. I was in the hospital. I'm glad to do it. A doctor, uh, is there any chance he could be wheeled to a telephone or call his wife? If we have to notify her in the ordinary manner, she's liable to think he's a lot worse off than he is. Well, I'm afraid he can't do any telephoning just yet, Sergeant. We had to give him a shot. Oh. Perhaps in a couple of hours. Well, she'd have to be notified by then. How is he, Doctor? I'd like to talk to you about him if I can, Captain. Yes, of course. Well, let's go over and sit down on the bench. I've had a rough night. Sure. Oh, uh, Sergeant, uh, I'd like you to do something for me. Yes, sir. Go to the admitting office and ring into the house. See what's doing. Yes, sir. Uh, right away, Captain. Sit down, Captain. You don't happen to have a cigarette on you. I left mine upstairs. Oh, sure. Thank you. There you are. Thanks. How about him, Doctor? He's going to be all right, isn't he? I hope so. Well, is there any doubt? It's only a cut in the thigh. Oh, there's no danger of him dying. I didn't mean to imply any such thing. It's not that. Well, what is it? Well, you remember where the wound was? Yes. About uh, three inches below the groin on the inside of his right thigh. About? And he was bleeding profusely, although the wound wasn't too deep. Bright red blood. Yes, and Sergeant Waters applied a tourniquet. Sergeant Waters probably saved his life. 
The point of the knife completely severed a superficial branch of the femoral artery. The main artery of the leg? Well, the femoral divides into two branches just below the groin. It was one of those branches. I see. Well, naturally, our main concern at the moment was to stop the flow of blood. And we were able to do this by clamping off the severed end of the vessel. His condition is weak from the loss of blood, but we've started on whole blood in addition to plasma, so that's no concern. You need any donors? I can call for volunteers. All of our men are tied. Not at the moment, Captain, but I'm sure the hospital would be glad to have its blood bank replenished. He's a big man, and he was running dry. We'll take care of it, Doctor. Now, uh, I could take him upstairs to surgery and go probing for the other end of the vessel. And if I found it, I could try to make a repair. Hmm. I don't know where I'd find it, if at all. He's suffering from loss of a great amount of blood. He's in a state of shock. If it were necessary to perform such an operation at the moment to save his life, I'd do it. But his life isn't in danger. The operation, however, in his condition would be at the risk of his life. Well, then, is there any risk if you don't operate? Yes. There's a 50-50 chance he'll lose his leg. Oh. The human body is a wonderful thing, Captain. It knows what to do when it gets in trouble. And a good part of the time, by natural processes, it makes us surgeons look very good. In a case such as this, the blood supply to parts of his leg is gone. The tissues aren't being fed. But there are compensating factors. Collateral circulation is set up by other blood vessels in the region. Now, if it develops that there is sufficient collateral circulation, then he'll be all right. Do you think there will be? Well, as I said, it's a 50-50 chance. Right now, there are indications both ways. The thing I'm worried about is that the lower part of his leg is cold and has lost its color. That's not a good sign. No, Captain, it certainly isn't. I returned to the station house at 11.25, and I telephoned directly to the 111th Precinct in Bayside, Queens. The commanding officer was not on the job. I spoke to the lieutenant on desk duty. I informed him that he would receive via teletype in a few minutes instructions to notify the wife of Patrolman Cochran of his injuries. I explained to him that Mrs. Cochran was pregnant and that fact should be taken into consideration when the notification was made. The lieutenant told me that he would send his patrol sergeant on the job as soon as the teletype instructions were received. After I finished the conversation, I walked out of my office through the muster room and up to the second floor where the prisoner, George Cotella, was being questioned by detectives of the 21st Squad. Is uh, Lieutenant King in his office? Yes, sir. He's in there, Captain. Yes. Captain Canelli. Come in, Captain. Hello, Matt. Hello, Captain. How is he, Captain? Not so good, man. What do you mean, not so good? All it was was a little cut in the leg. A little cut in the leg. George, you just sit there and keep your mouth shut. You're in enough trouble now. Don't make any more for yourself. I told you I was sorry. You'll be a lot sorrier. There's, a, there's an artery severed, Matt. If even money, you lose the leg. Mm, that's tough. You're going to lose the leg? Yes. That's what it looks like, George. Are you kidding why would I be kidding? Well, it was just a little cut, a little cut like that. It was in the wrong place, though. I feel terrible about that, you know. I, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I had a few drinks. I had no idea what I was doing. But you did it anyway. Well, I was drunk. I'm sorry. That's no excuse. I didn't mean it. You must have meant something. You went up there and bothered those people. You tried to make time with a 15-year-old girl. I like her. Is there a law against that? She's 15 years old. She doesn't want a thing to do with you. You threw her father out of the house. You were reeling drunk on wine. You pulled a knife on a police officer and stuck him. He may lose his leg. All right, you're sorry. What's it supposed to get you? I don't know, I guess. Well, I know, George, and I'm not sorry. Be married, Captain? Cochran? Yep. Married and has one child. Another on the way. So you've been notified? And the notification just went out. They live in the 111th. 
that you'll be coming in. Yeah, I told the desk officer out there that if there's any difficulty about transportation, I'd send a car for him. Well, I'll send a squad car if you can't spare one from patrol. All right, Matt, thanks. Maybe I'll take you up on that. Listen, what do you think is going to happen to me? I never been in trouble before. Not not in bad trouble, I mean. What are they going to do to me? I hope they throw the key away, George. They won't, will they? I mean, I never been in a big jam before. Yeah, but you hit the jackpot the first time you pulled the handle. After I turned out the 12 to 8 platoon at midnight and the men marched out the front door, the switchboard buzzer sounded. It was the desk officer at the 111. He informed me that Mrs. Cochran had been notified of the injury to her husband. She had telephoned her sister, who resided in Brooklyn, to come and stay with her three-year-old son while she went to the hospital. The sister was on the way by taxi cab, and Mrs. Cochran could not be expected at Mount Sinai Hospital before another hour. At 12.40 p.m., a car came by the house and drove me to Mount Sinai, where I was directed to the floor on which they had put Patrolman Cochran. Only the dim nightlights were on in the corridor. I approached the floor nurse. She told me the doctor was in examining Cochran again. I walked down the hall and waited outside the room. Several minutes later, a young woman hurried down the corridor in my direction. Excuse me, is this where Patrolman Cochran is? You're Mrs. Cochran? Yes. Well, I'm Captain Kennelly. Oh, yes. How is he? Hi, Paul. Well, uh, the doctor is in with him now. When that sergeant came and knocked on my door and told me he was hurt, I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how bad it was. I still don't. They said he was only caught on the leg. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Oh, that's a relief. You don't know what's been going through my head. I, I was imagining all sorts of things while I was waiting for my sister to come. While I was riding over here. I thought everybody was lying to me. He, he just got caught in the leg, the side. That's all, isn't it? Yes, that's all. Well, you know what a relief that is, Captain. What a genuine relief. I, I thought they just told me it was something like that so I wouldn't get scared or excited. Is this where he is? Is this the room? Yes. Can I go in now? Well, uh, the doctor is in there with him. Oh, yes, he told me. But, uh... I'll ask him. Doctor. Yes? Mrs. Cochran is here. Well, all right. I'm all finished. Hello, Captain. This is uh, Dr. Lowfield, Mrs. Cochran. How do you do? Doctor. Your husband's awake, but he's been on sedation and he's lost a lot of blood. However, I think it would do him good if he saw you for a few minutes. Oh, it would do me a lot of good, too. This way, Captain. Coming here. Yeah. Have you been here long, Captain? Oh, about ten minutes. Hello, Paul. Honey? Hi. Well, look where they got you. And for a little cat in the leg. Your three-year-old son gets a cat leg once a week. <laughs> Don't tell him his father can't take it. Uh, oh, Captain. Paul? What did they do with my friend? They booked him for felonious assault in 1897. Oh, I'll have to go to court in the morning. No, not in the morning, Paul. Not for a few mornings. Well, how long am I going to have to stay here? Well, we'll talk about that in the daytime. Oh, I'd like to know. I don't know myself yet. It's only a small cut. Are you disappointed? I'm not. I didn't know what happened to you. I thought everybody was lying to me. Oh, you're just naturally suspicious. Uh, Duncan. I am not naturally Can I suspicious. talk to you? Yes, yeah, sure. Well, I've got a right to worry. Me, oh, yes, of course. Well, that's exactly right. You're that doctor? No, uh, no thanks. I have my own now. Well, I want to thank you for staying with him. And the first hours are critical in these cases. You know, the two of them seem quite relieved that it's only a cut in the thigh. Yes. It's going to be rough breaking the bad news to them. Captain, I don't believe there's going to be any bad news. Oh? You don't? I just made another examination of his leg. It's warmer and the color seems to be returning. It seems that those natural processes I told you about are going to work. Apparently, there's going to be sufficient collateral circulation. Well, that's good to hear. Did you tell Cochran? No, I didn't. 
There's no point in telling him the best if he never knew the worst. You're right. There's no point at all. First precinct, Sergeant Waters. Where's this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, who is it that's hurt? Oh, you don't? Well, where's the man? Where? Well, which way on your cabin? Yeah. Yeah. Well, did you see him? And so it goes. Someone else tell you that. Around the clock. Through the week. Okay. Every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry go round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct Transcribed. A factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Canelli, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Gene Gillespie, John Sylvester, Louis Van Ruten, Eric Dressler, and John Aston. Written and directed by...